Timely topic as we look at, you know, Ultrasound World Conference and we start looking at some of the things that are going on in the world as far as energy prices are concerned, it obviously becomes more and more important to manage the types of systems that use that energy. So I'll let Wayne introduce himself, but thanks for being here, Wayne. You bet. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Wayne Perry. Uh, I have a day job. Oh, the mic. Hold on. Does that sound better? Yeah. Okay. My name is Wayne Perry. Uh, I have a day job. My day job is technical director for Kaiser Compressors in the U.S. Uh, I have been in this business about 35 years. Uh, <clears throat> Hank, of course, predates me in this business, but <laughs> there aren't a lot left who do. Uh, on the side, I work for the United Nations Industrial Development Organization teaching engineers in developing countries how to do compressed air systems properly so that they can go out and train people at the plant level. Uh, I also do consulting work and right now I'm working in South Africa. I have been working in China and Southeast Asia. Uh, I also do consulting work for uh, USDOE, uh, California Energy Commission, Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, uh, a whole host of other organizations. I am the current chairman of the rotary positive section of the Compressed Air and Gas Institute. I'm on the Standards Committee. I'm on the ISO TC118 Committee to help write standards for compressed air. So I get involved in just about every bit of this. And before I really get into the meat of the presentation, I do want to bring you up to date on some standards issues and some legal issues that are coming up that will affect anybody who's doing compressed air system audits or who is purchasing compressed air system audits or is interested in energy management. Uh, last year, the United States introduced uh, a new ANSI standard, EA4, that has to do with auditing compressed air systems. EA4 tells you everything you need to do to audit a compressed air system. That standard is about 60 pages long and the guidance document for that standard is another 60 pages long. <laughs> yeah, oh, the, it, it was a fight because it was going, try, they tried to put 120 pages in the standard and we all, all of us who were involved in standards making said, no, you can't do that. You take this out, you teach them, you know, give them a guidance document that tells them how to hook up a pressure transducer. Don't put it in the standard. <laughs> U.S. Department of Energy basically commissioned that standard along with EA1, EA2, EA3, which are standards on auditing steam systems, process heating systems, and pumping systems. And the reason they did that is they are developing what they call the Superior Energy Performance Program for plants in the United States or SEP program, uh, uh, where the Department of Energy is going to ask plants to improve their energy intensity. You heard about KPI, you know, how much, how many kilowatts per ton of product, whatever that KPI happens to be, they want that reduced. They want energy consumption or energy intensity reduced. Uh, so they developed these standards and part of being certified SEP plant in the United States is going to be that you have audits done to these standards by certified practitioners. So they're going to be developing a certified practitioner program as well. So if you want to do compressed air audits, <coughs> then you need to go through the Department of Energy's recommended course and it will probably be uh, hosted by ASME, the way it looks now, uh, and they will, uh, there will be training provided and then a test. If you pass the test, you are a US DOE certified practitioner to audit to those particular standards. In parallel to what's going on in the United States, ISO is developing ISO 11011, 11011. Uh, when I got involved with 
This particular ISO standard, it was two pages on how to audit a compressed air system. We fought with, I say fought, that's the wrong word. We negotiated to get ANSI and ISO to play well together because there was a real push from large corporations to have one worldwide standard to do auditing to. Uh, unfortunately to those of us who were involved in writing the standard, we didn't take into account that the way ISO makes money and the way ANSI makes money is not writing standards, but publishing standards. So ANSI was very against ISO uh, taking a large block of their standard and turning it into an ISO standard because they were afraid that they wouldn't, nobody would buy the ANSI standard, they would buy the ISO standard. So two years of ne uh, revenue sharing negotiations later, we finally got that worked out. So most of EA4, the US standard, is going to be in ISO 11011. We expect 11011 to be out uh, next year. Uh, we just were in Milan, Italy and argued for three days over one or two paragraphs that the Germans wanted in and we didn't. And we're successful, so we have one shall that needs to be changed to should and if that goes well, then 11011 will be finished. <coughs> So now there'll be an international standard. Part of that standard includes how to do leak detection. That doesn't say that you can't do, you know, if you're in the business of doing leak detection, you can still do a leak detection survey on a plant. It's just won't, it just will not be an audit to that particular ISO standard. It may be good to get the standard anyway and read it and see what, and you can buy EA4 and read it, and see what's required in the leak detection section of that and it's rather small and it's uh, everything that's been talked about here is uh, would be acceptable in that in that standard but still it would be good to know if you're planning to have audits done or if you're planning to do audits that there are standards out there now to have that done. Now you've heard also a lot about energy management and how effective uh, ultrasound can be and infrared can be and improving the, uh, 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 the equipment reliability and how that affects energy. There is another standard, ISO standard, that will be out 2012. It's ISO 50001. ISO 50001 looks much like ISO 9000. It is a management standard for energy. So it's going to involve continuous improvement, it's going to be monitoring all of your energy uh, needs and it includes everything coming into the factory uh, and everything generated inside the factory. For, actually it's not just for industrial, it can be used for commercial applications, residential applications if you want it. And that one we've been working on for since 2007 and it's just about <clears throat> ready to hit hit the street. Okay, those are those are the overarching just kind of what's going on in the standards world. Uh, now for the scary part, what's going on in California? Uh, California has a habit of uh, very well-meaning regulation that turns out to be almost impossible to comply with. Uh, the one that is in development right now for release January 2014 is Title 24, which until now has applied to buildings. It was basically, if you're going to build a building in California, it has to meet these particular energy efficiency targets. You have to have this much insulation, you have to have this kind of windows, uh, you know, it was just telling people how to build an efficient building and if you're going to build one in California, that's what it has to be built to. Well, California Energy Commission now has decided to include industry in Title 24. 
and I've been involved with the California Energy Commission's consulting group to develop the compressed air part of those new rules. <clears throat> and as normally happens, this consulting group has no clue about compressed air. Uh, so they're coming up with some very well-meaning rules that don't necessarily fly. Uh, so I just want to give you a heads up that's still in development. The consulting group has given their recommendations now after we've hashed it out to California Energy Commission. They have two years of public comment or 18 months of public comment. They're planning to make this, to implement this uh, in January of 2014. Some of the things that they're talking about include if you have, more, if you have multiple compressors in a system with more than 50 horsepower, you have to have a master controller. Initially, it was more than 25 horsepower, which means if you were a cabinet shop with three 5 horsepower compressors and one 10 horsepower compressor, and your total investment in compressors was about $4,000, you were going to have to spend about six grand for what they call a smart controller. I think we've gotten that over that hurdle. Uh, they also it, originally mandated that every multiple compressor system have only one trim machine and that trim machine had to be, had to be a variable speed machine. And we fought about that, so explaining that that's not always the most efficient solution, depending on the application. Uh, but it remains to be seen now what they're finally going to to uh, recommend to the California Energy Commission. Uh, but just be aware that if you do any business in California, uh, there's going to be uh, uh, some new issues you have to deal with. I heard th through the back door from one of my DOE contacts that uh, US DOE is looking very closely at what California does with Title 24 and if California is successful with coming up with some kind of uh, energy efficiency regulations for compressed air systems and pumping systems and process heating systems. US DOE may not be far behind. So it's important to watch what's going on in California. So that having been said, let's get ready. Let's talk a little bit about what we were what we're really here to talk about. You heard before that a third of the energy that is produced in the United States gets used by industry. Uh, eight to ten percent of all electricity generated in the United States goes to compress air. That's a huge amount. If you did nothing but get rid of leaks, inappropriate uses, and artificial demand, that would be cut in half. That's not optimizing the system. That's just getting rid of those, those issues. And inappropriate uses, I love to go into plant and find inappropriate uses. Some of the uses are, are um, classic, uh, like you're using air to agitate a liquid when you really should be using a, uh, some kind of mixer to do that and not compressed air. Some of them are a little less classic. Uh, I walked into one plant where every workbench in the plant had a copper tube running under the workbench with holes drilled in the tube to blow air on the people who were working in the plant. And they were plugged into their compressed air system. And when I went to the plant manager with all the calculations and said, you could air condition this plant for less money than you're spending on this. <clears throat> Uh, he said he didn't want to air condition the plant, but he bought floor fans for all the workstations. Turned out to be much less expensive, turned off half of the compressors in the plant. He was happy. Leaks, of course, we've got up there, this is a DOE estimate, 25 to 30 percent. Our company has done about a thousand uh, compressed air systems, done analysis on a thousand compressed air systems, and our average of all of those thousand is about 34 percent. That's what we see as an average. Uh, 
Uh, every year we have our branch managers come into the facility come into the facility for a little training and a little beating up on you know if they're not meeting their goals and I also review all of the uh, system audits that have been done and I hand out a money down the drain award to the branch that found the largest percentage of the leaks typically that percentage has been 75 76 percent uh, I have we have found compressed air systems using thousands of horsepower <clears throat> where 75 percent of that was used just to raise the air pressure in their zip code <clears throat> not at all uncommon now <clears throat> uh, Normally what happens when you have a lot of leaks as well is you're trying you have to keep your plant air pressure higher than you normally higher than you otherwise would because your leaks are leaking so much. When you go in and fix those leaks, that plant air pressure is going to rise even higher. And all unregulated uses are going to use more air. So if you're blowing off, if you're doing anything that's not regulated, if, there, if there's any system running in there, any component running at line pressure, it's going to use more air. If you think about the little chart that tells you, you know, a quarter inch orifice at 100 pounds will leak about 104 CFM, and if you drop that to 80 pounds, it leaks about 82 CFM, a little different. 20 CFM drop by just dropping the pressure 20 pounds. <clears throat> when the pressure in the plant goes up because you started fixing leaks, all those unregulated uses are suddenly going to use more air. So you have to be able to go back into the compressor room and reset the controls, get the, machine, get the pressure down <clears throat> so that you're not using that extra air. That extra air is known as artificial demand. That's the extra air used simply because you're running a system high at a higher pressure than you really need to be running. And almost all compressed air systems that I see run at higher pressures than required. When we go in and we start looking at what is the requirement for the tools in the plant, <coughs> Uh, 80, 90 pounds is it. And I often, uh, for the most part, I often see these 80 and 90 pound requirements being fed 125 pounds, 135 pounds. The rule of thumb is 1% for every 2 PSI. So if you can drop the pressure 10 pounds, you drop the power 5%. Very, very simple rule of thumb. Then, so we're looking at 50% of what's being generated actually goes to productive uses. That's a very, very poor percentage, but it's accurate. I was in, uh, <clears throat> I was in Vietnam two years ago, walked through a plant's compressed air system, managing director came up to me after the walkthrough, and he said, I'm so glad you're here. I said, he said, we want to run our compressed air systems just as efficiently as they do in the US and in Europe. And I said, if that's your goal, you're there. <laughs> I said, this is just as crappy as I see anywhere in the US, anywhere in Europe. I said, don't feel bad. It's very common. Uh, I showed him some things like this, you know, where 50% of the air uh, is being used productively, uh, and he kind of felt a little better about his compressed air system. <clears throat> I don't know when you when you do a leak audit if you if you see someone with the hose pointing down on them to keep them cool. Uh, I don't know whether you count that as a leak or as an inappropriate use, uh, but there are a lot of inappropriate uses out there. It is, uh, people think compressed air is free. It doesn't make a mess on the floor. Uh, 
it, it just means somebody's got to go turn on another machine if the pressure's not high enough. Nobody on the plant floor really looks at compressed air as, as a, a big expense. And in most plant operations, or in many plant operations, <coughs> compressed air is the largest uh, system expense that they have in there. It's not at all unusual for the motors to, that drive the compressed air system to total more horsepower than the rest of the motors in the plant put together. Unless you're in a paper mill and you've got a lot of pumps and things like that. <clears throat> this chart, which doesn't show really well, <clears throat> you know, I said 25-30%. <clears throat> this chart is of a uh, one of the few remaining uh, textile facilities in the U.S. Uh, <clears throat> their average demand during production is 9,500 CFM. Because we measure at least 10 days so that we get a weekend in there, we tell them leave the compressors on when there's no production so we can actually measure the leak load. The leak load was about 3,200 CFM. Now this plant did something very well. When they shut down for the weekend, they closed valves to the machines. With all of the valves closed, their leak load was 3,200 CFM. When they opened the valves to actually do work, their leak load was about 6,000 CFM. Uh, I went to this facility to present the results year and a half ago, and I had people from the corporate office, and I had people from the plant, from the plant manager down to the people who manage the knitting uh, uh, machines on the line, and the corporate people were aghast. They said, 6,000 CFM, over half a million dollars a year in power, to, to provide air to leaks. They said, we're looking for cost reductions of 20 or $30,000 a year, and you've got over half a million dollars sitting here. Why haven't you done something about it? And the upper management in the plant all sat there kind of quiet and didn't want to get their heads chopped off. And a lady who ran one of the knitting lines raised her hand, and she said, cost per dozen. He said, what? She said, I know my machines leak. If I buy the parts to fix that, spend the labor to fix all those leaks, it, caught, it goes against my cost per dozen. Your capital doesn't go against my cost per dozen. Your electric bill doesn't go against my cost per dozen. Change the way you grade me and I'll fix the machines. But if I, don't, if I fix them and save you half a million dollars, I get slapped. I get a black mark on my scorecard because my cost per dozen went up. And they went, holy cow. And then I was sitting there calculating and I said, oh, by the way, you've spent $600,000 in capital for machines you don't need. You have $600,000 worth of compressors, dryers, filters <clears throat> that you didn't need to buy. And you got half a million dollars a year. Yeah, it was a year and a half ago. I called them three weeks ago and said, have you guys fixed the leaks yet? No, you know, we're short on cash. And, <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, we're really st strained at that place. It's not making a lot of money. And I'm going, hell no, it's not making a lot of money. <laughs> You're dumping out, you know, a million bucks every two years. And I know what's going to happen. They've got manufacturing around the world, and they're going to decide that that particular plant's not profitable, and they can't figure out why it's not profitable, and they're going to take it, and they're going to move it to Vietnam because the labor rate is cheaper, or the electricity is subsidized, or something. And that's going to shut down U.S. manufacturing. Uh, my industry has a vested interest in keeping U.S. manufacturing in the U.S., because if it moves out, we're out of business. So you will find Kaiser uh, and other compressor manufacturers finally getting on the bandwagon saying, we've got to go out and teach you how to shut machines off. 
we've got to keep you profitable in the U.S., to keep you in the U.S. We have the expertise to help you do that, but we don't have a really good reputation as an industry. You know, uh, uh, more often than not, it was pat them on the back and give them the lowest price, and that was that. Now we're trying to retrain people to look at life cycle costs. But I thought that was an interesting uh, a chart. <clears throat> and it was interesting that you know, we thought we had pegged the leak rate and didn't realize <clears throat> we got one, uh, after we figured it out, we went back in and did one more and we said, okay, open up all the valves. And we got you know, a couple of hours of data to see what the leak rate was with all the machines open. And it was just astounding. U.S. DOE says 25 to 30 percent. Here's another not untypical uh, application. Uh, leak rate turned out to be about 880 CFM, and the average production rate was 1,000. So they were running a 200 horsepower compressor when they needed a 50. Actually, they were running uh, two 100s, and what they needed was 150. And we try to convince them, you know, fix the leaks, buy 50 horse, oh no, that's too expensive. <clears throat> My rule of thumb at a nickel a kilowatt hour is $400 per horsepower per year. So if you want to just walk into a compressor station and give them an idea of how much air they're using, if they're running a three shift operation at a nickel a kilowatt, it's about 400 horsepower per year. So about $80,000 to run a 200 horsepower compressor. If you're a dime, just double it. And it's a real easy way to do it. If you're running uh, one shift, cut that and make it a third of that. <clears throat> but it's easy, it's easy to work from. And then you can sit down and tell somebody right away how much money they're losing. Here was another one. Now this one, this is not the charts, but this is the table here. Uh, their average air consumption was 642 CFM and their leaks were 520 CFM. Now they did have a peak of, of uh, 870, but that du peak, peak duration was for only about 15 minutes and that was when they started the plant up in the morning. Uh, everything, because they leaked so bad, they couldn't hold pressure in the facility, so everything went to zero very quickly when they shut down. And when they start back up, everybody turns on, everybody gets their blow gun, <clears throat> blows all the dirt up in the air so it can fall somewhere else. <clears throat> and for about the first 15 minutes, they used as much as 870. Uh, but the leaks immediately used 520 and went on continuously. Uh, you, <clears throat> ultrasound is good at finding the uh, smaller leaks. Uh, you can, uh, that's, I'm a nice hand model, if you get the compressed air best practices manual you'll see that picture in there. <clears throat> uh, you'll also see that a lot of this split in this hose Anytime you use hose and a hose clamp, you're going to wind up with split in the hose. The clamp, uh, the hose is going to move, the clamp's going to eat into the hose, the hose is going to break. In this particular facility, if you notice, they had about a one inch line coming down and it went through a number of reducers to a four millimeter hose barb. And then they had this bicycle pump hose running down to the machine. They were running at 145 PSI in this line to get 65 at the machine and didn't know why. Uh, they also happened to have a lot of hydraulics in that facility and they had a hydraulic repair cart, ho hydraulic hose repair cart running up and down the aisles fixing hydraulic hoses. So we said take all this stuff off take a one inch hydraulic hose, run it over here because they had the same increasers at the other end 
to get them back up to one inch again to go into the machine. <laughs> said, put a one inch hydraulic hose in there. <clears throat> and we were able to drop the uh, pressure from 145 down to 110. And I believe that they're going to be able to drop it even farther than that. So when you find leaks and fix leaks, there are other, you've got to, it's not just, you know, explain to them that there's a leak here that needs to be fixed. Try to find uh, the proper way to fix it. A picture is worth a thousand words as well. <clears throat> Whenever I do a leak study, uh, I take a digital picture that goes in the study right along with, you know, here's where the leak is, here's how much it's leaking, here's how to fix it, here's what it looks like, here is what you should do in the future. <clears throat> and to a comment made earlier, throw the Teflon tape away. That's in every stinking report I write. Teflon tape is a very, very good thread lubricant. And if you're taking something apart and putting it together a lot of times in a demonstration panel like our little smart pipe out here, uh, Teflon tape is nice, but it will wear away. Compressed air systems tend to, tend to uh, uh, have vibration in them. And it's not a sealant, it's a lubricant. Use an anaerobic, tell them, tell customers use an anaerobic pipe joint compound. Something that seals in the absence of air because once this thing is screwed together, no air can get in there to help it seal. <clears throat> Loctite PST is my favorite. Something to remember is that NPT threads do not seal. They are a mechanical, they mechanically hold two pieces of pipe together. You have to put a sealant in them to get a seal, whether it's for liquids, gases, anything. And my personal preference is, after 35 years of dealing with NPT pipe is just don't use it in compressed air systems. Use copper, use aluminum, use welded stainless steel. I don't like anything with threads because threads invariably leak. The other thing that we often find is you go through and you're looking and there's an automatic drain trap. And you think, great, they're doing the right thing. They have an automatic drain trap. You put your ultrasound gun on there, no leaks at all. <clears throat> but it didn't leak because they had the valve turned off. So that's something else to, uh, to look for. And they had the valve turned off because the trap was broken. <clears throat> Now, instead of just dripping water on the floor there, actually it didn't drip it on the floor, it dripped it into this funnel that went into a pipe. Uh, it was filling up the receiver. Uh, it is not at all unusual for me to find, to drain 5,000 gallons out of a big receiver of water. It is not at all unusual. Anybody here from a paper company? Uh, oh, yeah. <clears throat> you familiar with a company called Domtar? Uh, I was in a Domtar facility. They had, and I, I walked in and I thought, these guys understand something about compressed air storage. They had, oh, eight or ten 5,000 gallon storage tanks, and they probably had a, half a dozen 10,000 gallon storage tanks. But as we started to walk the compressed air system, the guy said, you're going to need earplugs and earmuffs. And I said, that's the loudest paper plant I've been in. And they said, well, we have to walk by this one receiver. One receiver, they had a one inch ball valve wide open on the bottom of the receiver, venting air. And it sounded like a jet engine, like you were right next to a jet engine. It was screaming. I asked them, why are you venting all of this air? And they said, well, we had these automatic drain traps on there, but they kept failing, so we just took them off and <clears throat> opened the valve, and that's fine. <clears throat> so that was about a $200,000 a year decision. <clears throat> And when you ask management, 
you know. How much do the guys on the line who've got this tube under there, how much can they spend without getting approval? And then you explain that each one of them spent about 10 grand on their personal air conditioning system. And you explain that the uh, <clears throat> maintenance group who was not fixing the drain valves spent about $200,000 in compressed air. Uh, you start getting people's attention. <clears throat> when I do, when I do leak studies, I also leave behind uh, kind of a priority. I don't know if you guys do that, but I try to tell people, you know, first priority to repair as soon as possible are leaks that re represent safety problems due to blowing air, <coughs> noise, etc. A one inch ball valve is a safety problem. Car going by kicks a piece of gravel under there. <coughs> Air launches it, hits somebody in the eye, uh, hit somebody in the face, hits them anywhere, it's going to hurt. Uh, leaks that have the potential to interrupt production or cause equipment failure. The hose leaks that you saw had the potential to shut down that particular piece of equipment. And the strength of that hose and the type of the cut, it was inevitably going to happen and shut down production. So that one should have been a top priority. Large air leaks with loss that could cause local or total system drawdown. Uh, system drawdown is where you have every one of your compressors operating and the pressure continues to fall. You're drawing down the system. Your demand is higher than the supply capability. That happens not too infrequently. You never want to get a system in, in, in drawdown. Second priority, and I'd like to say these should be within one or two weeks, leaks that are in the top 20% for air volume. Uh, you know the rule of thumb, 20% uh, of the leaks are going to leak 80% of the air. Uh, so those are the ones you go after first. And if you're like most plants, they'll fix those and that's where it stops. Uh, somebody loses interest, uh, we've got something else to do, a machine broke, we don't want to go... <clears throat> we can't find uh, just exactly what kind of valve this is so we can get the right seal for it. or. Uh, there are all kinds of excuses for not going after the others. I consider a good system, basically if I go in and measure the compressed air system and measure it when it's off so that I can see what the leak rate truly is, if the leak rate's below 10%, I tell them, you guys are good. You're really not going to, uh, a leak survey is really not going to pay off for you at this point. Over 20, over 10 percent, usually I'll recommend, <coughs> I'll recommend that they do a leak study. But it's nice because we can actually measure the airflow uh, during non-productive times and tell exactly what, how many CFM uh, is leaking out of the system. Now, if you've got a 20,000 CFM system and you're leaking 10 percent, it may be worthwhile to go after 2,000 CFM. Uh, that does represent a pretty substantial uh, it's about $80,000 a year in leaks. So it does pay to get somebody, put somebody on that and start doing it. But if you're a 2,000 CFM system and you're leaking 200 CFM, maybe a little more difficult uh, to get that to pay back. <clears throat> but it's nice also that we have, when we do this, we measure the leak load, then we can come in with our UE, go through the whole thing, tabulate out what, what our spreadsheet says it ought to be, and it's always within about 5 to 10 percent of what we measure, which gives me a lot of confidence that, <clears throat> that the software that we're using with the UE is actually giving us legitimate leak numbers uh, when we're looking at a leak. 
If I could measure a leak load of 3,200 CFM and we went out and you know, found 6,000 or went out and found 1,000, then I would think either I'd send an idiot to go do the uh, leak study or something was wrong with the way we're calculating leaks based, leak rates based on the noise level. But uh, uh, I'm pleasant, I'm, I'm very pleased that, that the results we're getting from the UE system validate what we're seeing in the, uh, in the data logging. Uh, by the way, does, if anybody has any questions during this, you don't need to wait until the end because I'm going to try my best to get everybody out of here by 5 o'clock. And it might be easier to get everybody out by 5 if the questions get out of the way early. <laughs> How do you generate those graphs that have the, uh, the CFMs? That the, uh, How do we generate the graphs? You're talking about that? Yes. That comes from a day, we take data every 20 seconds, well, I'll take that back. We take data two times a second, unless we have a, a, an event like a bag house. Event like a bag house, you want to see what's happening in a fraction of a second, so you may take 100 data points in a second or 250 data points in a second. But generally, to get a good idea of what's going on in the plant, our data loggers will take two data points per second uh, they'll take a 20 second period, give me a minimum and a maximum during that 20 seconds and an average during the 20 seconds. Uh, no, well, this is my data logger. Sometimes it's with flow meters. Uh, if I have a modulating compressor, uh, I might take a vacuum signal off the, below the inlet valve because that gives me the flow through the machine. Uh, if I have uh, Load, unload compressors, I can take a motor running signal and a load signal and tell me when, that the compressor was running. I know it's going to be running full load or it's going to be unloaded. I know what the flow is going to be. <clears throat> and we can calculate from that. But we use oftentimes flow meters. And we generally use CDI. I don't know if you guys are familiar with CDI flow meters. Uh, it's a mass flow meter, but it's not the insertion type where you have to get it halfway in the pipe <clears throat> because invariably people don't. Uh, it gets in a turbulent airflow area. The CDI flow meters come out of Baltimore, I believe, somewhere in Maryland. <clears throat> they had come with a drill guide. You drill two holes. They've got clamps. They clamp a probe down into each hole and they give you uh, uh, 4 to 20 milliamp signal and an LED readout on what the flow is. You have to buy them pipe specific. So you have to tell, tell them it's a 4 inch copper, it's a 4 inch steel, it's a 6 inch steel because the rings that clamp on there are specific for that and the software in the little flow meter is specific for that size pipe. Uh, but we do, do use flow meters. now. Flow is just one of the few things that we measure. We also measure pressure uh, because you have to have a pressure measurement. You can have flow running just flat right at the top. <clears throat> if the pressure's steady, you know, okay, that's probably the true demand. If the pressure's falling, you know that the demand is greater than the flow and we're just getting everything that the compressors can make. So we have to have both of those. Sometimes we'll measure temperatures. Sometimes we'll measure ambient. Uh, as well to see what's going on. Uh, we always measure KW. Uh, again, because you can't really relate power to flow, and I'll show you a slide in a minute uh, that illustrates that. If you just try to measure amperage, you're missing part of it uh, because you can't have voltage fluctuations, so you're not getting a true kilowatt uh, signal. So when we do our studies, we use kilowatt meters and not amp meters. There are other people that use an amp meter and a pressure gauge and that's it. They take the amp reading and the pressure reading and they calculate what the flow might be. But without the voltage, that's not doing a lot of good. Power is the, using power to determine flow is the least accurate method that you can do. So Unless there's no other way to do it, we avoid that like the plague. Any other? Yes? The senorita has a question.
Al inicio, él decía un ejemplo de dos compresores. I can't, can't hear you. Hello. That's right. Yeah, sorry. At the beginning, you were talking about two compressors. The 100 The 100 horsepower. Y que la planta tenía, la planta podía utilizar, podía And that the plant could use one 50 horsepower compressor. Podía quitar los dos y poner fácilmente uno de 50. La pregunta. la pregunta es And the question is, ¿por qué no dejar why not leave uno de 100? yo no sé nada de compresor one compressor of 100 horsepower instead of going out and buying a 50 horsepower compressor ok <coughs> That, that's <laughs> but, but wait a minute okay. yo no sé nada de compresor she doesn't know anything about compressor <laughs> ok <laughs> Uh, compressors, compressors operate best under two operating conditions. One is off. That's when they're most efficient, when they're just sitting there. And the other is when they're running at full load. When compressors ha have to run at part load, they use almost most of them, except for variable speed drives, use almost as much power at part load as they do at full load. So, generally speaking, and, and what I see a lot is compressors that are oversized for an application, and, and the payback to buy a smaller compressor in power savings is one year or less. In other words, a smaller compressor running at full load will cost you much less money to operate than a larger one running at part load. Come again with the last phrase. Okay. A, a small compressor running at full load will use much less power than a large compressor running at part load. And that power difference oftentimes can pay back the cost of the smaller compressor in one year or less. When I see compressed air systems, can anybody hear me? When I see compressed air systems designed, uh, uh, the design process goes something like this. The engineering company gives the compressed air system to their junior engineer because nobody else wants to do it. Uh, the junior engineer goes through the list of equipment that reuses compressed air adds up all the usage, comes to a total, and he goes, boy, if I'm wrong, I'm going to get in big trouble. So he adds 30% to it. <clears throat> he then hands it to his boss, who looks at it and goes, this junior engineer probably doesn't know what he's talking about, and if he's wrong, I'm going to get in big trouble, and he adds another 30% to it. <clears throat> And then it goes out for bid to contractors. And the contractors are thinking, boy, if they're wrong on this and they get a call, they call me back and say, this is not enough air. They're going to blame me for all this. When I go out for a quote for this equipment, I'm going to add an, oh, another 20% to it. So I often see, for example, a 30 horsepower demand with a 100 horsepower compressor. And if you, or a 25 horsepower demand with a 100 horsepower compressor. And with, if you just took the power savings that you're going to get in nine months, you could buy the right size compressor for that application. So there's a lot of savings to be had. The other thing is when you go and you reduce the leak load in a compressed air system, you have this, you're going to be faced with the same issue. You suddenly have more demand or more supply than you have demand, and you've got to fix that, or or you won't see the power savings. Uh, anybody familiar with a company called Festo? Anybody? Festo? Great. They make pneumatic products, uh, motion control products. In the U.S., they have a a 
spectacular. I don't know how you would do it. They have, they, they have an audit for machinery. They will go into an assembly line and take everything in the assembly line apart, look for every leak, fix everything. They have cameras that take 50,000 frames a second so they can watch what's going on on very high speed operations. Uh, they do just a, a, a phenomenal job auditing the demand side. They don't do anything from the compressor pipe back, but where the compressed air hooks into the machinery, they do that very, very well. And they came to me about five years ago and they said, Wayne, we need your help. <clears throat> we have uh, been able to reduce air consumption on average about 30%. And we're seeing power uh, reductions anywhere from zero to four or five percent. And I asked them, what did you do back in the compressor room once you got your reduction in capacity? They said, well, we don't go back in the compressor room. I said, that's, that's the problem. So we partnered with them to, when they would do one of these demand side audits, we would go in and reset the compressor controls and so that they could see the savings that uh, show the savings to the customer and there would actually be dollar savings. But you can't just fix things, fix the leaks, you've got to go back and reset the controls and we're going to get to that in just a minute. Third priority, these are leaks that should be repaired within three or four months. Those are the ones that are relatively insignificant, small leaks. However, have a uh, history of developing into larger leaks. So uh, they will, if you're doing an ongoing leak audit, you'll find that the one that wasn't worth fixing last year, suddenly this year is in your top priority. Uh, and when you do fix it, Fix it right, so that it doesn't leak again for a few more weeks. Fourth priorities, the ones that only move up, those are, the, those are the ones that are hard to get to. And one of the ones that I really love to point out is I was in a cement plant, and four stories up on a pre-cooler building was an airline going across to a bag house. And in the middle of this airline, four stories up, was a uh, filter, which I'm certain got changed regularly, <laughs> uh, but it leaked. And it didn't leak a lot, but you know, you could. It was if you could stand on the, on the pre-cooler tower. It was about 20 or 30 feet out, and you could hear it with a gun. Uh, but I, I don't think they're ever going to going to fix that. That one. So that's one of the ones I would say would be fourth priority. Uh, how, we talked about making sure that the leaks don't reoccur. One of the biggest issues that I see uh, in leaks in compressed air systems is that the piping is not isolated from vibration, whether that's machine tool vibration or compressor vibration or whatever. Anytime you've got pipes or fittings that are vibrating, they're eventually going to work loose. If you're in the compressor room as well, look for uh, vibration isolators on the compressors, on the dryers. In other words, the pipe coming out of the compressor, there should be flexible pipe. Pipe into and out of the dryer should be a flexible pipe. There are heat exchangers in there and you're connected to an aluminum heat exchanger and the vibration on that aluminum, that's, that's the point where it's going to fail. Not to mention wind up with air leaks, but we, we see cooler failures, we see heat exchanger failures on dryers, all associated with the fact that they were, not, they were hard piped and not, no vibration isolation. Establish piping practices and equipment connection standards which provide for strong and durable connections to the compressed air system. Avoid the use of plastic tubing and push on connectors. Plastic tubing gets 
Well, uh, there are several issues with plastic tubing. Uh, one is that the uh, uh, it's rarely it's rare that a uh, manufacturer of plastic tubing sends his plastic tubing to the manufacturer of compressor lubricants and says, "Is this compatible?" And during the mid '90s, there was a rash of of uh, tubing failures, even on compressors, because the manufacturer switched to synthetics, PAO synthetics, which dried out uh, the nylon tubing, and the nylon tubing cracked, and oil went everywhere, or air went everywhere, it was a mess. Uh, we see that in other uh, plastic tubing as well. Teclon seems to work, uh, PEX seems to work, uh, but I, can, I can't tell you that the manufacturers of synthetic lubricants won't change the formula tomorrow and, and we're screwed again. So my suggestion is get all of the oil out of the compressed air lines, <clears throat> make the compressed air lines my favorite because I don't have to pay for it, stainless steel, uh, aluminum, copper, uh, no threaded fittings. Uh, those are good, good practices. Key points, compressed air leaks are expensive and can represent 20 to 50 percent of your total air demand. Again, like I said, they can represent up to 75 percent of your total air demand. Non-productive air demand can be measured, calculated from compressor load cycles, or calculated based on pressure drawdown rates. Uh, there are a number of ways that you can there are a number of ways that you can confirm what you got with your ultrasonic, that you got everything when you went on your leak detection probe, if you just sit there during a non-productive time and count the load cycles on the machine to see how much air is really going downstream, or if it's a VFD machine, look at the speed, calculate what the flow would be, uh, turn everything off, calculate the volume of your system and watch the pressure drop. And there are ways you can confirm how much is leaking out of the system. Artificial demand is a component of leakage, as well as any unregulated air demand. If the leaks are repaired and the system pressure is allowed to increase, the leaks are going to leak more, the leaks that are left are going to leak more, the unregulated uses are going to use more air, you have to go back and do something in the compressor station or all of this leak fixing isn't going to get you the benefit you want. This is a little slide I'd like to show up. This is the, uh, the amount of electricity generated <clears throat> that goes to compress air by state. Okay, I know I had my laser pointer. Ah, here it is. You can see Texas, Louisiana, Delaware, New Jersey, nine plus percent. Oh. Excuse me, Wyoming, but Wyoming's got a lot of big mines and about three people, so that's why it's so so big. Uh, these states, nine plus percent, and if you look at Montana, which has you know what, fifty, sixty thousand sheep and three people, uh, and no really no mines, and you look at New Hampshire and Rhode Island, and I don't really have to say a lot about that. But you can see that between five to nine plus percent, these states, and it's based a lot on how much industry uh, is there. This is what USDOE says is the current state of energy consumption by compressed air systems. If compressed air systems were optimized, that is, leak studies were done, Right, equipment was right sized, piping was done properly, uh, systems were controlled properly. This is what the map would look like. You see Louisiana, Texas, and New Jersey are still up there, but they're from nine plus, they went down to six to seven to five to six. They're big petrochemicals, a lot of their compressors are processed compressors, and that's not going to change. But from an industrial point of view, the entire country would be using less than 5% of the generated electricity. Right now it's 8 to 10. 
There's a huge opportunity in this country to save energy. To give you an idea, <clears throat> if you want to talk green to people, it's if we did this, it's the equivalent of doubling all of the current renewable energy sources that we have in the U.S. That's how much power we would save. We'd save the same amount of power as all of those renewables are currently generating. Wind, solar, biomass, all of that. And the, the thing is, this is not, this doesn't require new technology. We're not waiting for some new next thing on the horizon. And I might add it, I don't think it would require tax subsidies. No. No, it wouldn't require, he said he doesn't think it would require tax subsidies. It requires some different thinking, just like the lady at the, at the uh, uh, knitting factory said, if you change the way you grade me, you will change my behavior. And we have got to get through to these people that you can fix leaks. You can keep them fixed. It pays to do that. You don't have to spend capital for things you don't really need if you do things according to the best practices. The big challenge is how do we do this? How do we get people to account differently? How do we get it not to cost against your cost per ton or cost per dozen? How, how do we get U.S. manufacturing to wake up to the fact that they're leaving a lot of money on the table? Most motor-driven systems, just like I said, are initially designed with the assumption that more is better when it comes to the supply. That goes for pumps or compressors. <clears throat> Little or no thought is given to system efficiency in the initial design phase because it's farmed out to three or four different engineering companies. No plan for increase or decreases in system demand. When I go into Many plants I see that, okay, here's the original plant, and then here's an addition, and then here's an addition, and oh, we added some more back over there, and the original piping is still in the original part of the plant, and then they just tapped off of that to go to this other one, and possibly this original one was sized properly, but it's now not sized properly for what they're doing in the expansion. I was involved in the implementation of a compressed air system at a new facility and luckily caught uh, something that the contractor was trying to do. Uh, he had gone over budget in one area as he was installing this, so he turned in a change order to go from four inch pipe around the plant to two inch to save some money to offset where he'd gone over budget in the other place. The people who were sitting there signing the change orders had no idea that that would make any difference in their compressed air system. So you have to, you have to take a look at that. The lowest first cost is normally the goal. The people in the plant, the operations people, may have, may have specified just exactly the most efficient equipment that they need to add to their system. They hand it off to the purchasing department. The purchasing department gets a pat on the back for coming in to, under budget, so they buy something else, <clears throat> and then they don't buy the same dryer, and then they, the operations people have got to make what the purchasing people bought work together when it doesn't. Uh, so I understand all of those issues, and it's all based on lowest first cost. Sometimes However, we're now starting to see some companies that are looking at life cycle cost, and life cycle cost give you a much better handle on, on this equipment. This equipment should last 15, 20 years. Uh, if you look at life cycle cost just for the first 10, makes a good, good uh, uh, way to look at it. Uh, changing to uh, changes, this is for new systems, but if you try to change an existing system, you face the same issues. The size of the system has little influence on the potential savings. What that means is if I go into a system that's 12,000 cubic feet per minute or I go into a system that's 1,200 cubic feet per minute, the average savings, 
that we see from optimizing the systems about 34, 35 percent. We're going to drop the power bill 34, 35 percent on average and it really doesn't matter what size system it is. It may be if you have a small system it's going to be not economically feasible to implement all the changes you need but if you have a big system you get a lot of dollar payback. <clears throat> it usually is. The key to accomplishing an efficient system if you've got multiple compressors is a master controller. That is the number one failure that I see in compressed air systems. The knitting system that I said that was running at 9,000 something CFM and had 3,000 CFM worth of leaks. 16 machines all running on their individual pressure controls turning on, turning off, loading and unloading, fighting each other. <clears throat> if they would simply put a master controller in there without fixing the leaks, they'd probably save $100,000 a year. <clears throat> Matt, the, and this is what California is talking about requiring, is a smart controller that uses either pressure or flow, picks the right compressors, uh, to operate at a given load level. Uh, only has one trim machine so that you don't have multiple machines running at part load. <clears throat> uh, this is what it takes to do a good job. Now as long as you're getting a smart controller you might as well get one that has all of the uh, bells and whistles. If you pay for an audit up front <clears throat> there's no reason nowadays their controllers are out there that will give you a year's worth of data ongoing so that you can look back and say, okay, we shut down this particular line. What did that do to the flow? How did the, that affect the pressure? You can look at the load cycles of the compressors and see if you've got the right ones picked for this particular uh, application. If you want to add something, more production to it, you can see if you have additional capacity to be able to do that. You can graph power, you know. <coughs> You heard in another presentation that what you can't measure, you can manage. You heard that the people who really make the difference want to hear about money. They don't want to hear technical stuff. They want to know, show me the money. <clears throat> you can show them the money if you get one of the controllers that has, collects all of this data. You can show them it, that your improvement. You can show them especially that if you fixed all the leaks, here's what, here's what it was before we fixed the leaks, here's what it is now. And now we've got the leaks coming back. We get to this point, we fix them again, goes down. You can collect all of that data with a, with a smart controller. Just to give you a little idea of what we run into in, in the field, uh, this was, we had three rotary screw compressors, a wet tank, two dryers, two dry tanks, and then a distribution line. <clears throat> and if you notice this, as is typical, uh, we have a 500 CFM refrigerated dryer and a 400 CFM refrigerated dryer. The question I always wanted to know is how does the air know just to send 400 through the 400 CFM and to send 500 through the 500 CFM? I, <clears throat> it's always, that's always a challenge. <clears throat> when we looked at the data, and this is averaged over five minutes so that you don't get so many squiggly lines. We saw some peaks of 630 CFM. However, uh, it was typically about 250. Uh, we had a baseline of about 50 CFM below which it never fell and we assumed that was the leak load because they had no ongoing uh, air use when they were not in production. And what this tells me is, this, knowing this particular application, this is probably compressors responding to pressure changes and not true demand. In other words, I get this sudden increase in flow and I got the sudden increase in flow because a compressor came on, not because I had some demand down in the system. Uh, the other thing that we noticed is we had uh, one compressor that came on one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times in a day for a very brief period of time and the rest of the time it simply ran unloaded. 
and it ran unloaded 24-7, 365. I mean, it ran in this cycle all the time uh, and used 48 kilowatts to do absolutely nothing. Had there been some master controller instead of it running on its own control, or had someone gone up and turned it to off? But you only know to turn it to off if you're watching what's going on in the system. Most compressors you can't walk up to, you hear them running, but you really don't know how much error they're making, whether they're running at part load or whether they're running at full load. And it's scary sometimes to go just turn one off uh, because you don't want the pressure to fall through. But this one certainly could have been turned off with, with really no effect on the system. This was the existing situation, and this is horrible. 66, almost 67 kilowatts per 100 CFM. Uh, that means to make 100 CFM took them 67 kilowatts. If you take a brand new compressor and you put it in its optimum operating range, uh, <clears throat> in other words, not in a compressed air system, but simply flowing through a flow meter and you measure it, you'll get somewhere between 18 and 21, uh, depending on the pressure. <clears throat> if you, as soon as you put it into a system, that all changes. Uh, but in an optimized system, after that system was optimized, it went from 67 kilowatts per 100 to 21 and a half kilowatts per 100. Uh, they saved about uh, $20,000 a year in power costs. That wasn't the driver for making the change, but that was a nice little uh, savings to add into it. Now I want to give you a little comp a, a little. <coughs> Uh, case study, and then I will open the floor for questions. I'm going to try to get finished by 5 o'clock so those of you who are taking the test can cram for it or buy the answer key from me after uh, with enough time here. <coughs> this case study uh, was at a, at a container board and packaging material manufacturer, not international paper. Uh, one named GP and not IP. They had gone through and done their demand side. They had reduced their uh, inappropriate uses. They had done a leak study. They had fixed the leaks in the system. Uh, and they called us and said, OK, can you come in and clean up the demand side system for us? So when we went in, I mean the supply side system, when we went in, we found they had two 150 horsepowers and one 125 horsepower compressor. All three of them were modulating machines and all three of them were running at about 43% of full capacity and just happy as a clam, just sitting there. Uh, from a manufacturer's point of view, modulating machines are wonderful. They get up to temperature, they sit there and run, they don't, they're, because they're running par partially loaded, the bearings aren't overloaded, it's, it's just great. From an energy, it's great if energy's under two cents a kilowatt. Uh, from an energy point of view, it's horrid. But <clears throat> from a uh, uh, manufacturer's point of view, you get a lot less warranty when the machines get up to temperature and run at that speed 24-7, <clears throat> everything's happy. So these, these machines were happy. They were paying an average of almost 10 grand, $9,500 a month for power. When they optimized, they optimized with one variable speed machine and four fixed speed machines. And they were very careful to make sure that the fixed speed machines fit into the control range of the variable speed machine. I'll give you just kind of an example. Most, not most, many applications I see, uh, let's say there are three machines and the customer bought one variable speed machine because the power company would rebate some money on it, but he bought all three machines, say 1,000 CFM, and he's happy. And his 1,000 CFM variable speed machine has an operating range between 350 and 1,000 CFM. And his other machines are 1,000 CFM, load-unload. 
So he's going to trim with his variable speed machine and use his other ones to uh, <coughs> load and unload with. As long as the demand is from 350 to 1,000, his variable speed machine is real happy. It's running in its variable speed. It's the most efficient way to make that. As soon as the demand goes to 1,100, the variable speed machine can't keep up. So what happens? A fixed speed machine comes on. So now he's at 2,000 CFM for an 1,100 CFM demand. So the variable speed machine slows down. It's still making 350, so he's got a total supply of 1350 and a demand of 1100, so the pressure continues to rise very quickly, normally, which either shuts down the VSD or it shuts down the uh, uh, fixed speed machine. Pressure immediately drops and one of them comes back on. And it plays that little game between 1000 and 1350 when again, now the variable speed machine is in its in its sweet spot. So what he should have done was bought the 1000 CFM variable speed machine and then bought 600 CFM fixed speed machines so that when the VSD went up to 1000 and it pulled in a 600 CFM machine, this thing dropped back and now it's running at 400 CFM or 500 CFM, the VSD is, and this fixed speed machine is running flat out and nothing is going to change until it gets all the way up to where it turn, brings on another one. So the key to making these things work right is to size the fixed speed machines and the trim machines to work together. That's not just a VSD trim issue, that's if you're trimming with a variable geometry, variable displacement, even if you're trimming with a modulating machine, your fixed speed machines need to fit within the control range of whatever that trim compressor is going to be. So they had four <coughs> fixed speed machines, one variable speed machine, and note, note the Japanese steakhouse grills that they had on top. They did heat recovery as well, but they didn't want to, for some reason, connect directly to the machines, so they put blowers in here to actually suck this stuff air up. Yes? Box plant? Yes. Uh, when they put in the piping system, as they brought more air in, they went up in pipe size. They came in at 45 degree angles to reduce turbulence. That reduces back pressure. That makes the machines, uh, that saves a little bit of energy as you're starting to put the compressed air in. Uh, uh, it's much better than trying to go in with a T. <coughs> The other thing they did was they anticipated expansion. So their main header system, they way oversized. This is an oil mist eliminator filter, and you can see they used a little uh, spool piece there and necked it down to fit it, knowing that as they increase the size of the system, the only thing, they don't have to change this pipe again, all they have to change is that spool piece when they put a bigger filter in. Good thinking. Uh, I wish I had designed this one, but they did it themselves. They did a, they did a good job. <coughs> they also put in a master controller, again, so that they could monitor what was going on in the system. We did two jobs for Georgia Pacific. Uh, this one, we didn't use a flow control. We used a relatively small tank because when we measured their demand, their demand was relatively steady. If you're going to put a variable speed machine in, it's capable of making those changes. The other facility that they had, uh, they bought 11 350 horsepower rotary screw compressors to go along with two 600 horsepower centrifugal compressors. <clears throat> and they had two 15,000 gallon storage tanks and an 18,000 CFM flow control. They wanted to be able to lose one of their 600 horsepower centrifugals and start two 350 horsepower compressors and have the people in the plant never know it. And they did. But it just took a different constellation of equipment and a little different way to look at it. <clears throat> the result, 46% uh, reduction in energy consumption. Less than a two-year payback, four to five thousand dollars a month uh, savings. Uh, one of the things that we really target when we set equipment up is to ha have 
a very low unloaded runtime. Uh, if the machine is running unloaded or at part load, but even but really unloaded, it's using electricity and not putting anything into the system. So in this particular instance, although you can, I don't know if you can see it, there's the duty cycle. Load. Oh, $3.60. Uh, that particular month, which I think was July of 2004, he spent $3.60 in power for the entire month running unloaded. The rest of the time it was full, his equipment was full load. And that simply means the controls were set up <coughs> and the storage was set up such that if, <coughs> uh, if the machine was not, if a compressor was not required, instead of unloading, timing out and shutting down, it just shut down. The controller knew enough to say, okay, this machine, <clears throat> I've run long enough, I can shut it down without having to worry about a, you know, the motor being hot. I can restart it immediately if I need to, so we'll just shut it down now. <clears throat> so there are ways to do this, but the thing is, <clears throat> this was after they had already done all of their demand side optimization. If you're going to change compressed air systems, you have to do the demand side first. If you're going to do the demand side. Because if you do the supply side first and then do the, the demand side, you've got to come back to the supply side and do it again. So if you're going to do both sides, do demand first, then supply, so that you can get everything tuned for your existing conditions. I have an email address up there if you guys need any questions answered. I will be glad to do that. It's a very, very simple email address, wayne.perry at kaiser.com. And by the way, it's Kaiser and not Kaiser. Kaiser means cheesemaker. Kaiser means emperor. It's a little different. <coughs> That's why our machines are yellow. That's what I tell people. Uh, and again, I will be glad to help any of you with any questions you have uh, and direct you to anybody else in the industry that might be able to help if I can. Kaiser. Kaiser. Anybody have questions? Yes, in the back. Wayne, I'd like to take you back to um, your initial comments about the standards. Yes. Um, what would be the, the difference or the advantage between using those standards versus just um, picking up the ultrasound equipment and doing a survey on your own? And my second question would be, um, what will be the eventual impact of those standards um, in, within the industry? I mean, are they going to be mandated standards eventually? OK, did everybody hear the question? Related, are these standards going to be mandated? What's the difference in just picking up the ultrasound and doing it yourself? Uh, the, only, the only time I see uh, these standards like EA4 uh, being applied are going to be in applications where company like Dow or 3M or Corning uh, or Toyota wants to be a part of the Department of Energy Superior Energy Performance uh, uh, program and get whatever recognition that that is going to bring. DOE is going to require it if you want to be part of the program. For the vast majority of plants in the United States, they are not going to be part of the program. <coughs> Uh, it's not going to be a requirement. It's still good to look at that standard because it really gives you a good idea of what you should and shouldn't be doing when you're looking at a compressed air system. I would recommend that every manufacturer buy the standard so that if they want to do uh, their own system analysis, they've got the step-by-step, -step, this, is, this is what you should be looking for, this is how you should look for it, this is how you should report it, 
It's just a good basic guide. Uh, again, I, uh, oh, I have to be real careful here because I do a lot of DOE work, but U.S. Governments in general really don't have a clue as to what's going on in the real world. Uh, I was, yeah, I have to be politically correct here. Uh, I've been on conference calls uh, the last couple of months with USDOE because they want to reach 10,000 plants by 2013. They want to go out and, and have assessments done on 10,000 plants by 2013. And those of us who were on the conference call were going, you know, that's like got to start now and uh, run 24-7 for the next three years, if or next two years, if you want to do this, it's 300 plants a month or something like that. Oh, you can't do that? Uh, not when you're going to spend 10 days on each one of them, no. <clears throat> So there's a lot of this going on. How much of it sticks when it hits the fan, I'm not sure. But I think everybody needs to be aware that it's floating around the fan and it's going to hit it pretty soon. Other questions? I want to thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the evening. And <laughs>